We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of The Awakening on October 31st, Halloween 1980. It was written by Chris Bryant, Alan Scott, and Clive Exton, based on the novel The Jewel of the Seven Stars by Bram Stoker, directed by Mike Newell, and released by Warner Brothers. Bram Stoker's Jewel of the Seven Stars was published in 1903. The story has been adapted twice before this film, once as a TV movie, The Curse of the Mummy, in 1970, and then as Hammer film, Blood from the Mummy's Tomb, in 1971. In 86, a fourth version, The Tomb, was released, and in 98, a fifth, entitled Legend of the Mummy Hit Theaters. This came on the heels of two other Bram Stoker adaptations, Dracula and Nosferatu the Vampire, both in 79. In 1976, Heston was offered the lead role in The Omen and turned it down. In the wake of its enormous success, studios set out to greenlight a lot of supernatural thrillers, including this one, and Heston didn't want to miss the boat again. This is basically just an Egyptian version of The Omen. Yeah. The director later admitted that the film was utterly terrible, but he adored working with Heston. A sandstorm ravaged the set during the goodbye scene between Charlton Heston and Susanna York. Uh, So that was real in the movie. This was one of the first Egyptology films shot on location in Egypt. This is amazingly Heston's only foray into the horror genre, unless you consider movies like Omega Man or uh, Soylent Green, I would say. The book's original gruesome conclusion was removed for a 1912 re-release of the story. Ben Foster was born the day before yesterday. (laughs) Uh, The one I read today was the 1912 version where they slapped on like a happy ending and a wedding. (laughs) It feels very weird. Um, But this, the movie basically ends how the original draft of the book ended with, with less happy things going on. Mm -hmm. The first title is a special thanks to Egypt and various antiquities organizations who offered the production rare access to their buildings and exhibits. The rest of the titles are for no reason shots of Egyptian monuments filmed through rippling water. It mostly feels like a waste of cool B-roll, and I can't focus on any of these statues clearly. When the title comes up, I was worried for a brief moment that this was an alternate language version of the film because the title said Allah 39 Eclipse, which is the Italian title. I assume it has something to do with the 39th Eclipse, even though it's the 31st Eclipse. eclipse. (laughs) Well, it had 39, but it had like a degree symbol. Yeah, it said 39 degree Eclipse. (laughs) I was like, wait, what? We see the silhouette of Charlton Heston's character, Matt Corbeck, pacing at the top of a sand dune at sunset. A familiar shot. Yeah. It it was very reminiscent of uh, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark specifically, uh, when they're first trying to uncover the well of the souls and the sun is setting behind them. Yeah. And it's Indiana Jones pacing with his classic fedora. And this is him pacing, not I guess more with a, it's not really a fedora, but it's more like a safari-esque, I guess, kind of hat. It's close. I, I There are so many bits and pieces that are very much Raiders of the Lost Ark that I can't imagine this was not an inspiration. And also, I'm pretty sure Raiders of the Lost Ark itself was admittedly based on a Charlton Heston film, right? Isn't it like The Treasure of the Incas or something like that? That was like the, the movie that was that he had in mind when he set about writing when Spielberg and Lucas started writing this movie. Yeah, but I feel like throughout the entire time I was watching this movie, I'm like, oh, there is a slightly better movie here if you just redid all this. And I'm sure Spielberg watched this movie and was just like, you know what, there is a better movie here if I just redid this. Well, the weird thing, though, is that if it came out now and Raiders was next summer, so he must have had some of this already in the can by the time this movie oh, came is out. Oh, that, is Raiders really 81? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Then, so, then probably isn't an influence. It, it. it's, it's just a 
a weird coincidence or maybe they saw this and had some ideas for some shots yeah yeah during the or heston was sneaking into their dailies and was like all right here's what we're gonna do guys (laughs) yeah uh a title tells us this was 18 years ago yeah and so uh, i wanted to immediately jump on that do you think it's better to do to just to say 18 years ago or to To say say a year 18 years later Oh, Rather to the, tell us before we watch and yeah. then and then move ahead in time? Yeah, or do You're, you prefer... I agree. I, I prefer 18 years later because 18 years ago is irrelevant to us. Yeah. We don't, because even 18 years in the future isn't necessarily our time period. Mm-hmm. Like, right. Because it doesn't age well then when you say present day. It's like present day when? Yeah. Like, uh, but I, also there's nothing to indicate that it's 18 years earlier other mm-hmm. than story elements, like character that has to age. Yeah. But there's not like we don't see anyone using an 18-year-old piece of technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not necessary. That night we see him rushing to his home where his pregnant wife, Anne, offers him a drink. She offers another to his research assistant, Jane, and Jane wants to make it herself, but Heston's wife insists. She also seems kind of pissed about it. We'll notice later in the scene that she's pregnant, but... It's not as clear when she's making the drinks. Matt shares photocopies with Jane of a cartouche from their dig with the name chiseled out and replaced with a different one. A carbon dating test has been ordered, but they suspect that the replacement name was added 20 years after the name that was chiseled out. What makes it especially interesting is that this particular name has been erased from a lot of different places. They have a lot of engravings they found, and in all those places, this one name seems to be missing. Jane leaves the room later, which gives Mrs. Corbeck the space to complain about her. She thinks her obsession with Matt is an unhealthy one, and that the two of them spend all their time together following a trail led by some author from the 1600s who predicted an Egyptian queen missing from the history books. But just because she isn't in the room doesn't mean Jane isn't within earshot from this, and uh, in the next room over she can hear everything Anne's saying crystal clear. Anne is upset at the lack of attention from Matt, And he tries to explain that if this tomb is intact, it will be the greatest discovery since Tutankhamun. And besides, their child won't be born for another two months. But Anne seems skeptical that he'll suddenly become an attentive husband and father in two months' time. I don't even understand why she's here. I don't either, actually. In the book, she's not. In the book, she just is in another country. Yeah, being... I mean, you can still... You can still have the pregnancy occur and the baby's birth and all that stuff. It can all still happen. But I don't see a reason for her to be here here it makes it better if he's not there for it yeah in in my opinion well i think we're just uh if, if anything we're just setting up his negligence as a father but wouldn't it be worse if he left her at a hospital in london and flew back to egypt instead of just left her at a hospital in cairo and I mean, drove back i not necessarily because i i mean because if, if they call him and say hey something terrible happened it's like well, now I can't get there in time. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, before I think, he could have gotten in a car. Yeah, I think it's worse that he, she's there and he's repeatedly ignoring her while she's sure, there. Sure, yeah, that's true. As, oppo- as opposed to being, look, I left you where you were safe and comfortable mm-hmm. and I'll be back before the baby's born. Yeah, because she's making the sacrifice during her pregnancy to be near him. Yeah. The next day, Matt arrives on the dig site and says Anne wasn't feeling well to explain his lateness. Jane seems uncomfortable after what she heard from Anne last night and Matt invites her on a run. While he drives, Matt apologizes for Anne and blames everything on her pregnancy. Jane seems very understanding. They pull over in a random part of the valley and start digging along a canyon wall, and after some weird animal sounds, a rock slide reveals to Jane some new hieroglyphics on the cliff face. Now, they had no reason to stop at this location. Nope, nope, none. And when I saw the rocks sliding, I thought those were rocks sliding from him digging. Working above her. Yeah. That's what I thought at first, too. Yeah, yeah but it's like he's not anywhere near her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just rocks falling. She calls to Matthew to come check it out, and they dig away the rocks blocking the words to read the message. Here the gods come, not to any summons. The nameless one must forever be alone. Do not approach the nameless one, lest your soul be bird. That's what I think she says. I can't understand. <laughs> Do not approach the nameless one, lest your soul be weird. Beware the man who comes from under northern skies and shall let loose that evil once more upon the world. For the nameless one must not live again. The nameless one 
Uma. Matt and Jane take turns rappelling down a cliff face to a ledge outside a door. Matthew understands the importance of delicacy here, so he brought a sledgehammer. Well, also now, I, now I don't, I don't understand where they are here. Well, I thought this was the door. I did too. I thought this was like the, um, the top of the door. The lintel. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lintel and so like i figured they would dig down and reveal the door but then they had but they walked up to this from the road yeah. so why did they need to repel from the top and they a- do a lot of weird stuff on this cliff they face do. they do like there's a road below you yeah he starts pounding on the door with all his strength and with each smash his wife experiences terrible cramps back at home where she waits for him all day it looks like she's having a problem with her pregnancy Eventually, Matt and Jane break in and immediately find a carving on the wall with the face scraped off. So someone's been in here and then reclosed the door? No, I think the assumption is... Or that's just what is, it looked like? No, I think the assumption is that when they entombed her, they scratched away her name and her face from all of the the carvings. Because but why do the carving if you're going to That scra- is a great point. Well, well they, uh, <laughs> Heston has a line. To, about that oh, okay. they said that they they start building the tombs the moment they are they come into power oh okay oh, and then they go and destroy the thing on the way out yeah okay so oh, so evil. yeah they started building her tomb right away and when they figured out that she was messed up they said well, we're gonna have to mess this place up yeah <laughs> uh matt rubs his hands all over this like this stuff isn't important priceless artifacts jane reads the hieroglyphics to identify the person illustrated here as daughter of the sun Beloved of Osiris, Queen of the Egypts, Kara. Kara. Kara is her name. Uh, in the book, it was Terra, but in uh, in the movie, it's Kara. And I don't know why they didn't chisel this name out if they screwed up the face right. on everything. Like, it shouldn't be here either right. if the same everywhere people took it everywhere like else. He who must not be named. Yeah. Matt and Jane head back to where they're staying in a Jeep. And he finds his wife, Anne, collapsed beside her bed, moaning in pain. He throws her into the back of his truck and races overnight to the hospital in Cairo. She wasn't due for another two months, but she hasn't said a word since he found her. And her eyes are open. She's just staring straight ahead, hypnotized. He hands the doctor a note with information on where to contact him because he intends to return to the dig site, as he isn't useful here to help her. He gives her a kiss goodbye, and then we cut back to the dig site. They're rappelling down this cliff face again, and they move into the cave. They dig rocks out of the wall to get behind the mural they found on their first visit. While they dig, we hear the screaming of Anne in the hospital, and cut back to that. Like with every rock they pull, she Mm -hmm. screams more. The doctor enters, and she screams in the doctor's face, all without moving. In the cave, Matt finds a corridor with steps leading down. The walls are lined with hieroglyphics. They follow the stairs down, and we cut back to the hospital where Anne is being given an oxygen mask and her legs are in stirrups, so it looks like the baby's coming prematurely. Back in the cave, Matt and Jane locate the burial chamber, and it's completely intact. There's treasure everywhere. We cut back to the hospital where a different doctor is breathing into a straw in an attempt to resuscitate Anne's stillborn child. Because I, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier. They established that she's about seven months pregnant. So yes. Yeah, two yeah, months yeah. left. Yep. So. Uh, they give the baby an injection on the table. And in the burial chamber, everything is just stacked up like it's a storage unit. Which, judging by the photos of King Tut's tomb, is basically how they packed these mm-hmm. things. Yeah. yeah, they didn't uh, build them too big. Yeah. Jane is just picking up shit willy-nilly with her bare hands. She's shining a flashlight on everything instead of taking the thousands of photographs of every yeah, item in each location anything yeah in the hospital Anne is being rolled out of the operating room asking to see her baby and we pan across the room to the stillborn child being covered with a blanket as the doctors step away it looks more like a napkin yeah <laughs> it's like a like a thin sheet of like medical paper yeah, it just said marriott on the corner <laughs> Matt finds the actual sarcophagus and just walks right in and opens it with his bare hands. He yeah, li- just by himself. Yeah. This is not the only time in the film he does this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he lifts the top off and we hear the baby crying and cut back to the hospital to see that the child is revived by this. Matt touches the hand of the mummy and it recoils at his touch, which freaks him out. But why the fuck is he actually touching the flesh of this mummy? Yeah. yeah. This is ridiculous. He's a professional. He would not do that. Well... 
I guess you could argue that it's already taking hold of him. Yeah. Like I guess this mm-hmm. this this obsession. Anne sees the baby in the nursery, but seems pretty upset still. And the doctor says, "Oh, don't worry, she's completely healthy." And then Matt shows up, and he looks very pleased about everything. When she tries to ask him where he was when she went into labor, he kisses her instead of answering. To be fair, though, she wasn't due for two more months, and he could not have predicted that she would start premature labor. All he knew is that she was in the hospital and and basically comatose. Yeah, you still don't abandon your pregnant wife in the hospital. Hang out I don't. for moral support. Back at the dig site, workers carry all of the treasure out of the tomb. This is terrifying to watch. It's like, yeah. who are these people? How much are they getting paid to not just steal this stuff? Yeah, and the same way we stupidly repelled off a cliff instead of just walking up from the road, they're like hoisting stuff yeah. up the cliff. Yeah, like, why, why, are, why are you bringing it to the, to the highest road point? down from yeah. where you're taking this stuff out. Why are we going up? Uh, also, like, I think you need to catalog and photograph all this stuff where it is in the in yeah. the tomb before yeah. you start taking it all out. Yes. While they're craning the sarcophagus out of the burial chamber, a man enters with paperwork and demands that they hold on removing any more of their discoveries until everything has been approved by the Cairo Museum of Antiquities, which I believe is the same place that Rachel Weiss's character works in the 1997 mummy film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Matt doesn't seem to care about this warning, and the man reminds him that these objects belong to Egypt and not Matt. Because we're, so we're in present day as in it's 1980 when this is taking place. No, this is still 18 years oh, earlier. Oh, sorry. This is, okay. Yeah. So, so it's, this it's the all like 62-ish. Yeah. Still. It's well after the time when all those uh, those people that went out to raid tombs yes. mm-hmm. got reprimanded and had to give it all back and say, yep. okay, I'm sorry, we won't take stuff out of Egypt anymore. So he knows better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe he does. Maybe he wants to shake hands with mummies. The men use a crane to lift an entire wall of hieroglyphics all the way up to the top of this mountain that the tomb was discovered in. I think crane is a strong word. Yeah. (laughs) It's more more like a gantry that's just with a pulley. I mean, it's just a... it's a pulley. It's a rope. (laughs) But clearly, from any perspective, lowering it from this ledge would have been less of a danger to the artifact because the road is down there. People could have received it. (laughs) Uh, One of the ropes carrying the load snaps, of course, and a metal cable swings back and wraps around the neck of the man who threatened to stop their dig. And then it, like, consciously drags him over the cliff after it wraps around his neck. Well, yeah, it's, well, it's the the stone falling drags him, throws him him. down. Yeah, but the, the cord snaps, so I assume what's wrapping around his neck is the part that was connected to the top, not connected to the rock. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's it wraps around his neck at the top of the cliff. And then he falls off the edge and he's hung by it for a second before he starts ragdolling yeah. rapidly and then crashes down into the rocks below. Now, there's, there's a couple of, I will say, quote unquote, accidents yeah. yes. that occur. And are we to assume that this is a supernatural yes. accident? Yes. yes. Okay. That Kara is facilitating her escape from this cave. Right. Matt heads back to the hospital to tell his wife that he can't leave with her and the baby, that the dig requires his supervision. He tells her that he would be of no use to her, and she finishes the sentence, Can be of use to yourself, I can. And he just agrees instead of realizing this was an insult. And she says, No, that's fine. You go be with Kara and Jane, and me and Margaret are going to go back to London, and we don't need you. That's right. I need to come back to this accident again real quick. Yeah. Um, Because I don't understand why. Why? Because this guy was going to stop... But the they're dig. not. They're, well, they're going to stop it temporarily. They're not going to permit. They're not going to seal the tomb. She's but impatient. She, but but also, she wants to make sure that he is the guy that is able to look after uh, all of her artifacts and and the. But body. wouldn't he still be? Not necessarily. I mean, if 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 the Egyptian government comes in and says. Don't touch this stuff. This is our stuff. We're going to put our guys on it. Mm-hmm. It might have nothing to do with him. It might be like later in the movie when they're like, thank you very much. Here's a parting gift. See you later. Yeah. Matt has to shove his way through a crowd outside the Cairo Museum of Antiquities. The government of Egypt has decided to reward Matthew for his find with a golden Ankh hand mirror from inside the tomb. Which is ex- which 
the way he handles it, it looks like it's extremely light, even though that thing yeah. should weigh like thirty pounds. Yeah, it should be. He should be using both hands at the very least. Yeah. it's like the cross from the fog, where you're like, "How are you lifting that?" <laughs> <laughs> That's like ten bullion all just glued together. <laughs> A gift for his newborn daughter. Matt receives an urgent call at the museum, and we cut directly to him running full speed into the hospital room where his wife was. She has left the country with the baby. The doctor says that. She tried to stop her from leaving, but she wouldn't listen. We move forward in time 18 years to the quote-unquote present. We float around the museum at night. We see multiple close-ups of the face of the sarcophagus. Some sparkly dust twinkles off of the hand of the standing mummy of Kara. I don't know why they would stand this thing up if it's the real thing. It would definitely still be laying down. Yeah, I think I, I feel like it would should be laying down. Uh, as a solar eclipse is darkening the museum. Large cracks grow across the glass case containing the sarcophagus. Matthew, now bearded, arrives at work at a university and is informed that someone from the London Museum of Antiquities is here to see him. The man tells Matt about the cracks in the glass of his finding and informs him that they've resealed the vacuum, but they're doing a fungal analysis to make sure that the mummy is preserved properly. I didn't realize that they put those things under vacuums when they they seal them in glass like that. I think the oxygen ages them very quickly, so mm. they have to do it that yeah, way. Yeah, I, I mean, and to me, like a vacuum is problematic only just because it's it's harder to maintain versus something like that you would use like a like a inert gas like argon, mm-hmm. yeah, which also doesn't allow decay, but you could keep it at an air pressure so that it wouldn't be that want of escape yeah. on the glass right because that could cause physical damage if like when if, if the glass kind of were to break or the or the seal in the vacuum were to give way mm-hmm. you cause physical damage to these items that are then moving because the vacuum is expanding mm-hmm. and this cave that it was in in the first place obviously wasn't airtight either yeah so yeah but it's it's rel- it was relatively contained because right. that air hadn't changed in whatever it was 3000 years. Yeah. Well, and and I'm sure that they preserved it in some kind of new way before they put it into this chamber. Yeah. Like they they blasted it with like uh you know whatever uh, gamma rays just to kill off whatever might be in there before they seal it up. Yeah, which they should should have just kept doing. <laughs> just keep hitting it with gamma rays. Like Super giant. mummy. <laughs> Hulk mummy. mummy. <laughs> Matt seems very concerned for a guy who literally just opened the sarcophagus and touched the mummy. Now he cares about fungal contamination. Uh, it sounds like Matt wants to visit the piece in person. On his desk he notices the picture of his daughter and recalls that her birthday is approaching soon we cut to new york city where his daughter is visiting a zoo or works there i don't know i think she's just visiting but yeah she's having way too much fun she sees a uh, jackal i think it's a jackal i didn't google this a jackal jackal it's a jackal it looks like a jackal 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 it's a jackal jackal time it wasn't right the first time you said it why the hell would it be right the next 10 times and it seems terrified of her in his home office we see matt Labeling a package containing his daughter's birthday gift, the Ankh from earlier, Assistant Jane enters, now his wife, Jane, his wife, (laughs) I'm assuming they're married, I don't know. Which is exactly what her, his previous wife feared. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what, you left me? Fine, I'll go marry this person that you thought I was already having a relationship with. Yeah. Uh, But she guesses accurately what he's doing here, that he's wrapped up the Ankh hand mirror and that he's sending it to his daughter. Jane drives him to the airport in London And we cut to him arriving in Cairo. He meets with the museum operators, and it sounds like they're worried about the flesh of the mummy having contracted a fungal infection because it's losing weight, and Mm -hmm. so they think it's being eaten by an infection. Uh, They also are concerned that it could be viral instead of fungal, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not really sure... How that would work. How that works. Yeah. Doesn't a virus need living cells to reproduce? I I thought so. I thought that was the whole point of a virus. Maybe they're saying something about this mummy though okay (laughs) the sarcophagus and the wrappings have tested negative but they insist that they must test kara's flesh and matthew is dead set against this idea but also what are they going to do if the test comes back positive can't they just treat the mummy however they would if the test came back positive right because obviously whatever they were going to do wouldn't destroy it because otherwise they wouldn't do that uh it's not like it's going to be like oh it's positive put it in the furnace (laughs) it's like (laughs) no it's still a mummy 
Matthew disregards the advice of these experts, instead proposing that he bring the mummy back to London with him. Like, it's mine. I'm going to take yeah. it. And they're like, what? No. Uh, <laughs> but the man who disagrees with him is almost immediately hit by a car and killed outside the museum. Look out! <laughs> So again, are we supposed to assume yes. that this is a This is Kara saying, Take me to London. Like, I want to but, travel. But how is that set up? Like, cause it did he did she did either She coaxed him into the street. Yeah, that's what she I say. Like froggered the, him out there. Yeah, <laughs> that's the only <laughs> way I can see it working. Yeah. Is that well, he just she, she does that to other people too. She just entrances them. Yeah. I I I get this one more than I get the crane one. But yeah. But because this is the one who's like actually like trying to stop him from this goal right now. Uh, but it just seems like, yeah, but the indication is more that this car comes out of nowhere versus he's distracted. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like something should have happened, like his briefcase pops open or some, something yeah. other than him just blindly walking out into but the it, street. But I feel like controlling some somebody is actually more logical than the inan- controlling inanimate objects. But she does that too. <laughs> I know. What if? What if instead of what happened? What if she literally sat up and pushed him into traffic? Would you have preferred that? <laughs> I, I, I just, I just, I just feel like so far these things are explainable accidents yeah. versus supernatural. Well, but that's I, how you got to work if point, you want to get away though. with it. I, I feel like I have a lingering doubt versus later in the movie when we have hissing snake statues and, and howling <laughs> doors and windows bursting open. It's like, yeah. okay, this is clearly a supernatural Yeah, but event. that's that's called, you know, you have to build on the suspense. You have to have that She's lingering doubt. She's getting stronger. Like, mm. oh, is it a coincidence? Or is this, was this guy suicidal? Maybe he's just really sad about working at a museum. <laughs> We see Margaret hop out of a friend's car outside her mother's house and she moves inside. This is a really weird scene. Mom is preparing a meal and she says to mom without much explanation, I want to fly to London and see my dad. She's like, what? Why? What? No, he left us. He's terrible. Why? I don't know. I just do. Her mother tries repeatedly to stop her and blackmail her emotionally but Margaret seems to have her mindset on it. Upstairs, she finds the gift from her father, and she looks into the hand mirror, and we see Kara being craned down into a truck wrapped in what looks like just a thin layer of plastic uh, to replace that glass. But but I, I, I love I love the reveal when the sarcophagus in the crate comes down. Charlton Heston leers up from it and goes, <laughs> yes, yes <laughs> <he> this way. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in charge of you again. Yeah, I was really confused by the wrapping it in plastic, but in this open-sided crate. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, how is how is this sufficient enough to move this across the world? Yeah, it's it ridiculous. No it, this is less dangerous than what you're talking about doing just here in Cairo. Well, I mean, I guess the one dude that was planning to stop him is no longer a threat, so they just let him take it well yeah because, nobody else had any objections well the other guy that was with them said i'm going to advise that we do it, it that it do go to london and right. the museum head of the museum guy's like no i'm not gonna let you do that yeah oh. so, so there was one vote for each side and then one of those votes committed suicide yeah okay but i don't but i don't think he makes a good argument for why it should go aside from you know he's obsessed with i can't get my favorite soda here <laughs> I'm like he doesn't nec- he's he's not he doesn't seem to be like an in the field restoration type right. person no. like he's a teacher and and so I don't know why he could make an argument that they're better off bringing it to London for any reason. Yeah, the there's, experts there's... in the world are all in Egypt. Yeah. He he also doesn't seem like he's a good archaeologist <laughs> that he the whole the whole thing is that he just wants to be famous. When he finally finds the tomb, he slams it open with a sledgehammer. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like he he just wanted his moment, like his big moment. And but even the people at Tut's tomb were so much more careful. Like, there's literally a picture of it with, like, the doors locked still with mm-hmm. that with that rope, you know? Yeah. Um, where they and they took pictures of literally every square foot of the place as they moved inside before they moved anything. Right. But I but I, I, I think the, the contrast is that this he's just this is mine. Right. I made this discovery. I'm the man. This yeah. is this belongs to me regardless of what you say. 
but he does pretend to be humble at first and he he pretends like oh this this tiny onk from what i found thank you for giving me this tiny piece of my discovery Mm -hmm. but then later on he's like fuck you guys all of this is mine yeah um i guess you could argue though that they do have a specialized piece of equipment in in england they have the electron microscope that they're planning to use and and i I, guess we should presume that they didn't have one yeah in egypt in egypt but they don't put the whole mummy under the microscope no, they're putting they samples, samples yeah which they could just fly fedex out. the sample <laughs> they don't have to send a whole fucking mummy to london that's true on the campus where matthew works we watch margaret sneak into the end of one of his lectures he notices her and he's momentarily distracted i thought because he recognized her no but apparently not <laughs> well all, all, also if you're sneaking into someone's lecture you sit in the back Yes. You don't you don't stumble forward <laughs> through the, the projector. Front. Yeah, <laughs> and you, you can sit as close as possible. Yeah, but after class, all the students pile out, and only Margaret remains. And it still takes him a moment to realize, aren't you related to me somehow? So she didn't even tell him that she was coming. No, nope. she just showed up. Yeah, um, but this is where I noticed that his classroom very closely resembles that of of Doctor Jones. Yes, we cut to them dancing at home, and over dinner, Matthew tells her about Kara who I guess they've just never had this conversation before. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, she was 18 when she died, Kara was, and supposedly very evil. Uh, I I also like that they talked about her having a relationship with her father, and he says incest was very common, and then it's like, wink. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's unacceptable. Uh, Jane recites the hieroglyphics that they read off of the cliff face about keeping the nameless one hidden. Apparently, Kara's father forced her to kill her lover and marry him, because incest was so common, as revenge when her father was inspecting the building of his own tomb, she arranged for a stone block to drop on him, crushing him to death. She killed everyone who ever spoke to her father, which amounted to thousands of people. The people say that she had powers, including the ability to reincarnate herself. She even left strict instructions on how to resurrect her that involved 31 eclipses between her death and resurrection. Matthew tells her that if they had the canopic jars and the seven-star jewel that they could complete the ceremony themselves. The idea of needing the canopic jars to resurrect this ancient mummy is a story point that also comes up in the 97 mummy. Mm -hmm. Jane tells Matthew that he said too much and asks him to stop but Margaret has already put two and two together. She understands that her father intends to bring this mummy back to life. Matthew has the mummy laid out on a table, and he shows it to his daughter, Margaret. He tells her that usually all the organs are stored in these beautiful canopic jars, but they were either stolen or never placed in the tomb because they weren't found. I'm guessing they weren't stolen because there was a lot of shit in there that was worth a lot of money and yeah. they wouldn't just take the canopic jars. Well, Maybe you misplaced them because you were not careful about cataloging yeah. and yeah. not moving things. <laughs> How much did you pay the guy that was just like wandering off of, with all the jars under his arms? Uh, more likely we're about to find out that the organs were never removed, though I'd wager they'd do an x-ray of this thing and determine that earlier sometime in the last 18 years. Paul Whittier, the man who came to tell Matthew about the mummy's glass breaking, walks into the room, and he's introduced to Margaret. At night, she gets a call from him, and he invites her on a date to the theater. They come out of the theater at intermission and reluctantly agree that the play was extremely boring, so they head out to eat. I think it's pretty brazen of him to go and ask his colleague's daughter out on a date. And no work up to it either. It's Mm -hmm. just literally the first time I call, it's like, hey, by the way, we should go on a date. Let's do it. Well, and that the phone call comes in. It's like, oh, Margaret, there's a phone call for you. It's like he didn't ask like, hey, you know, or... professor, you know, uh, this might be too forward, but I was wondering if I could ask permission to invite your daughter out to the theater. Like something yeah, yeah. like, like it's just, like, just like, hey, shorty there. What? <laughs> You're talking about Margaret? <laughs> sure. What's she wearing? Put her on the phone. Okay. A group of scientists and Matthew look through this electron microscope at the fabric from the sarcophagus. It looks like they found a virus in the cloth. It's about 800 angstroms wide. You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen. I don't. (laughs) Paul suggests that they send the entire sarcophagus back to Egypt so they can eradicate it there, which was my suggestion in the first place. Yeah, because these guys are not the experts. Why did we take this thing out of Egypt? Yeah. But also, like, aside from, like, the movie like wanting him to you know the 
the goal of the movie is to have him perform this ceremony and to get the daughter back to egypt but like it could have stayed in egypt the whole time yeah she could have come to visit him there she could have i don't understand why why we moved this thing for like two seconds to figure this out yeah matthew insists against returning egypt's property to egypt and he tries to explain to Margaret his fascination with this find and ultimately decides, you know what? We will take it to Egypt. Both of us. You're going to come with me. You've never been to Egypt, have you? Um, I was born there, Dad. Uh, she's ecstatic, but Jane is very worried about this. In Egypt together, Matthew watches his daughter climb ancient Egyptian ruins like they're a fucking playground. Yeah, I, <laughs> with all the like the notes at the beginning of thank you to the people of Egypt and yeah. all this other like. This did, is really did, awful. Did you say that you would be climbing on their collapsed structures? Matthew wakes in the camp in the middle of the night to see Margaret just staring off at the tomb. She's been a little weird for the whole movie, but here she seems completely hypnotized. And once they step inside the tomb, she is fully possessed by whatever weird spirit is causing this. She approaches her father and reminds him that Kara married her father, even though she hated him, and then she moves in to just make out with her dad. (laughs) (laughs) I think this is when you turn to me and I'm just like... You're just like, oh God, no, 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 no. Hopefully he is also possessed, otherwise this is really fucking weird. Because he doesn't shove her away or look disgusted or confused or anything. He kind of just looks like he's ready for another kiss when she pulls away. Their companion on this dig, Yosef, is reading symbols off of the tomb ceilings and moving through rotating wall doors without them. He comes to a dark hole in the wall when suddenly something slides out of it and stabs him through the chest. And then vanishes back into the darkness. He collapses, and the rotating wall closes behind him. Stepping away from her dad, Margaret quickly finds the shattered kerosene lamp that Yusef was carrying. There's no other sign of him, and Matthew decides that he found a hidden doorway. Margaret points to the marks in the dust on the floor, and they realize that there's a door here that must open and close. Matthew presses a button on the ceiling, and the door opens again to reveal Yosef's dead and bleeding corpse. Matthew must have kneeled on the same pressure plate because, again, this blade slides out of the wall, but misses him somehow. And then Margaret just runs in and hugs him. I'm like, no, no, no. Get out of the way. Yeah. Don't stand where the stabby thing goes. Yeah. Move before you comfort each other. <laughs> no, no, no. I want to die like this, making out with you, Dad. Oh. <laughs> Apparently, neither of them is going to acknowledge what happened earlier. And they're right back into the treasure hunting mode. Nobody's seeking medical assistance for their stabbed associate. They're just like, he's for sure dead. Let's keep going. Matthew collapses to the floor when he finds canopic jars containing the organs of Princess Kara. He reads a riddle off the wall. We wait the one. He who comes from, from under northern skies to bind him to our will. No joke, I'm pretty sure there was a dick and balls in the hieroglyphics of this scene, but I guess it's up to the eye of the beholder. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) The eye of the ball holder? The Uh, ball holder. Uh, So, just, what were the ancient Egyptians that made this tomb thinking when they carved all of the instructions? They were like, I bet a guy from London is going to come back and resurrect this lady. But not even that. Like, they don't want that to happen. Like, everybody is against this, except Mm -hmm. the person who's dead. So, why are we writing down the recipe to bring her back? I don't know. And why are we leaving the jars? Like, I I get it, we put it behind a hidden door, but how about we just don't put it in here at all? Yeah, or destroy them right now. (laughs) Well, it's my assumption that there was probably some faithful followers, and they hid all this stuff and left the instructions in this hidden room so that when the rest of the stuff is defaced... Yeah. It's it's at least like still possible to yeah okay all right but I don't recall so far any indication or in these instructions they talk about seven stars and sacred jewels I don't remember anyone saying that oh yeah there better be a pregnant woman nearby yeah that's true that's a very important part of this equation well but they did prophesize him so the mm. idea that they knew that he was coming they could know that he was also going to have a pregnant wife at the time I don't know. He turns over the bust of Kara on the floor. The, the other side of the bust has right. the jewel of the seven stars embedded in it. 
Right. And but it's all, all of scratched these, up. Right. And all of these stars are Ursa Major. They're all in right. the shape mm-hmm. of like the, the Big Dipper and they're... The, the, which was the same star configuration like on the ceiling of the tomb when they push right. the button and it's on the jewel and it's and it keeps coming up. Back in the hotel, Matthew is busy shaving when Jane finds canopic jars in his luggage. <laughs> <laughs> and she knows he brought this home without permission from anyone, but asks anyway. She also doesn't seem to know that they lost a man in their expedition, but I guess that doesn't matter either. How could this tomb have been accessible to everyone for 18 years and no one ever found this rotating door? Did they not read every surface in there? Like, I feel like Mm -hmm. that's a huge part of this. I really wanted Jane to just drop the canopic jars she's holding here and have the bloody red heart just flop out on the floor. Yeah. But uh, he stupidly tucks all the canopic jars into a safe in his office while a workman is in there doing some maintenance. Mm -hmm. I thought for sure this was going to be... Like, this guy was a spy for someone, and they were going to find it later. Well, I guess the implication is that he just had this safe installed. installed yeah. But, but wait why? for the guy to leave before yeah. you do that. Yeah, like, <laughs> like it's it's such a bizarre thing. Why do we even need to have the setup that this safe is being installed? Just yeah. I, be- I would believe that he has a safe. Nah. <laughs> just have him have a safe. That's ridiculous. I need to see this getting installed. Also, where'd this house come from that he lives in? We should have seen a whole construction team walking away. Yeah. <laughs> to further implicate himself, he wears the key to the safe buckled into a shackle on his wrist. It looks huge and uncomfortable and extremely conspicuous. Jane finds him in the backyard later and accuses him of wanting to perform the ritual. He informs her that in addition to the canopic jars, he also found the Jewel of the Seven Stars. I guess that's what was lodged in the scratched up side of the carabust he found on the floor. He sounds like he's interested in performing this ritual specifically to prove that it won't work because he's trusted science for so long. Like the speech that he gives is like, oh, well, I'm terrified that it could work, but this is the only way that I can prove that science is right is by fulfilling this ritual exactly. And when nothing happens, I'll know that I I chose correctly. Otherwise, he's been on the wrong team this whole time. Matthew heads to an observatory where he has a scientist confirm the number of complete solar eclipses between Kara's burial and today. Matthew was correct in his prediction that it was exactly 31 eclipses. Next, Matthew asks if the constellations move, which anyone past elementary school could tell you they do. Mm -hmm. And the scientist does some sort of test to tell him that the constellations would have come full circle and are in the same place today that they were then, which is weird though, because he only has the year to go off of yeah, and not a specific yeah. date and they would move within a year. Well, no, because he's, ta- he's not talking about the rotation of the Earth like relative uh, or the Earth in its orbit relative to the constellation. He's talking about the actual rotation, like that the, there is an orbit to the constellations themselves, I presume to like how a galaxy is rotating. Right, because uh, you know, we, we see the stars on a plane, but... All those stars are different distances, not just left and right from each other, but forward and back. Those stars are right. bigger and smaller. Yeah. And uh, you know the you know if you were to to ter- to look at them sideways, they would all the the shape of the constellation would be different from the side. It wouldn't be a flat plane. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm describing this to the audience. Um, there's a really great exhibit of this at the Griffith Observatory, um, where you stand and you're standing looking at this constellation, the lights that make up the Big Dipper, and you as you see walk how around, far away it, some you, of them you are. see yeah, you see like the, the actual right. spread. So, so they're talking about the the orbit of the constellation itself having taken about three thousand years to return to the same position. Okay. Which I don't think it would. <laughs> I think they would just continue to move yeah. away and further. They wouldn't come back around. Yeah. Right. I think it would have been more interesting to have them had in the tomb like a configuration of the stars as they were and then another separate configuration is like when the stars look like this that's when yeah. mm-hmm. that's when you'll know. And have him bring a rubbing in and then he holds it up to a monitor and it just happens to be the same scale. Right, right, right. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Matthew calls Jane from a payphone in the rain to ask a favor. He tells her where to find a spare key to his safe and asks her to smash the canopic jars. I'm guessing either she does not comply or will not survive this attempt. Uh-oh, a statue of Anubis is watching her sneak through the house towards the safe. <laughs> as soon as she gets the safe open, all the doors are thrown open by the wind outside. She wanders away from the safe 
and hears a steady breathing throughout the house. Suddenly, it sounds like a rattlesnake is approaching her, and she locks herself in Matthew's office. She realizes the hissing is coming from a golden snake on Matthew's desk. It's not alive. It's literally a statue of a snake made out of gold. But it's glowing, and papers are being blown in circles around the room. Jane moves out onto the balcony inexplicably, Mm -hmm. and another gust of wind pushes her over the edge, where she falls through the glass into a greenhouse. The wind stops immediately when she hits the ground, and she struggles to move until a leftover shard of glass falls off of the frame of the greenhouse and lands directly in her neck. Our second consecutive movie with a tracheotomy. <laughs> so this was this felt like a okay. It pushed her out the belly. Oh, she's not dead. Hold All on. right, hold <laughs> on. And then the wind comes in and yeah. Yeah. This, this glass shoots down and yeah. spikes her in the throat. And if that didn't do it, cancer. <laughs> <laughs> she just dies of cancer right there. <laughs> she just comes out with a gun. Just <laughs> yeah. There we it's go. A mummy with a gun. <laughs> Oh my god, that's a great grindhouse title. <laughs> mummy with a gun. That's the only thing more terrifying than a mummy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to start writing this tonight. We cut directly to Jane's funeral. It's it's as uh, abrupt as when we cut to Carolyn's funeral in the House of Dark Shadows where you're yeah. like, oh shit, that person's <laughs> dead. Uh, one of the cars in the funeral procession has Margaret in it and she's watching Paul argue with her father in the cemetery. Paul says he spoke with Jane the night she died and she was very worried about Matthew. We cut to Margaret convulsing against a window in the same bedroom with the safe. Like we literally cut, she's in this car Mm -hmm. at the funeral and we cut immediately to her leaning against a window and just kind of shaking and swallowing weird against the window. And then in a reverse angle, we see her father's body slide across the floor towards the safe. Yeah, with, with by the wrist that holds the key. Yeah, yeah. and the wrist uh, key becomes unbuckled, and it's cutting his skin. His arms are bleeding now, and then we cut directly to a doctor bandaging his arm. But I was so confused in this moment because uh, Margaret walks Paul into another room, and she pulls her shirt out of a dresser, and the sleeves are all bloody, and she says... This blood wasn't there when I put this shirt on, and it's not her blood. But I felt like I missed a couple scenes here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whose blood is it? Well, I assume it's his from his wrists, but like she doesn't seem she doesn't seem to have a clear memory of that time. But neither do I, because I didn't even get to see it. Yeah, it's it's pretty unclear what's happening here, aside from maybe, you know, they're they're being possessed or. But I had to back it up because I was like. I missed something important because she's standing there convulsing in the window and suddenly her father's just sliding across the floor towards the safe. And uh, I don't know if it got the, if the safe opened. I don't know what happened with the key. I just know that he was bleeding from the wrist and then suddenly there's a doctor bandaging it. But why would she have blood on her clothes? Because she tried to get the key and open the safe. I don't know. and, and, And then, and did she? I don't know. I get the impression there was another incesty scene here and they cut it to just these two or three shots that we saw Mm. because it feels really weird on its own. Mm -hmm. She confesses to Paul that she was in the house when Jane died, though we didn't see her and Jane was running all around the house following strange noises. I feel like there's no reason to not include Margaret in that scene uh, if she was there. Because we already suspect her of being weird because she kissed her father. Yeah, so there's no reason we couldn't show her just watching as as Jane got knocked off of the balcony or something. Mm -hmm. In fact, she should have been standing over her body before that glass shard came down. Yeah, just looking down from the balcony Mm -hmm. as the glass fell. She says she doesn't feel like herself anymore. Later, we see her applying makeup in the mirror, but when she turns her head, half of her face is all scratched up like the bust of Kara with the Jewel of the Seven Stars in it. She drops the mirror and collapses to the floor, crying and holding her face. Which isn't actually, when she looks in the shards of the mirror, right. her face is normal again. Yes. So it was just a vision. We see her in a psychiatrist's office. The doctor is evaluating her for a potential case of schizophrenia. The psychiatrist here is being played by Ian McDiarmid, who couldn't possibly have suspected that 24 years later, he would have been edited into one of the movies that we've already reviewed this year. <laughs> 
Margaret tells the doctor she isn't here for reassurance. She's here because she has blackouts in which she injures people and she wants an answer or a cure. I'm terrified of myself. The doctor suggests that she check herself in and observe footage of herself during her blackouts. She has a very sudden breakdown and insists that her father is the one who should see a shrink. She continues trying to speak, but she's stuttering over words and can't even say Kara when she's convulsing like this. Well, I think she's even speaking like Egyptian. Yeah. She, like, it's almost like she's speaking in tongues. The doctor goes for an emergency syringe of probably Thorazine that he keeps in his desk for exactly this purpose. When she sees the syringe in his hands, she tackles him to his desk, plunging the needle into his chest. She keeps pounding him in the back, uh, pushing the needle deeper and deeper into his heart until basically the whole needle is inside of him. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, this, this uh, syringe was made of glass? Yeah. That's just because uh, the, the, the syringe itself breaks as he's mm-hmm. laying on the needle and yeah. being you know pummeled by her. Uh, but I'm pretty sure this guy would have died from this i think so i yeah. mean we never indicate we really that she's being charged with murder after this point right she's just in the hospital yeah Anne heads to see her daughter at the hospital matthew finds Anne kneeling beside margaret in the bed matthew catches paul walking through the london museum of antiquities the next day this is a weird scene yeah paul tells him that margaret believes that she's kara reincarnated when did that conversation happen between you two did, well, did this was this what you talked about during the intermission earlier i mean paul was the one that she went to with the bloody nightgown and said i you know i'm having problems so presumably they talked more yeah but i feel like uh he would have just been like yeah that's why she's at the psychiatry ward if she thinks she's being yeah. reincarnated as a mummy Checking on her again at the hospital, Matthew hears a whispering voice asking for his help, but his daughter's lips aren't moving. She grabs his arm, and the wound from the shackle starts to bleed again through the bandages. Matthew removes her oxygen mask and heads home to collect all the ingredients for the ritual. He rolls the sarcophagus into the museum, and he takes it upstairs in the elevator and opens it up. Again like single-handedly yep. just lifts this lid off from the front end like it's supposed to take like four or five people to do and he's this. at the head of this and he just lifts it up and just yeah. like it's just yeah. off <laughs> like even like the in indiana jones when they're lifting the ark of the covenant even though it's just two guys they're really struggling yeah to lift this thing out of there we cut to Anne finding margaret's hospital room empty And then we cut back to the museum where the canopic jars are all arranged exactly as specified around the open sarcophagus. Matthew places the jewel of the seven stars in Kara's hand and lifts her face mask. Now his daughter approaches from across the museum. Um, There was some really interesting musical cues here. Very like the the reminded me of the shining. Yeah. Um, It's that I can't even know how to describe it. It's a drum. It's kind of going like it's like it's really quickly rolling drums yeah sure uh, but uh it was like oh this is like right from the shining <laughs> i like the look of margaret here because um you know she has since put on like this thick eyeliner and she did has, she put it on yet yeah yeah so okay. she, when she enters the museum she's already she's already got thick eyeliner she's got two she's got two braids coming down from the side of her face that sort of mimic like the headdress yeah. a, as well as um like how they how they have these bands of uh necklaces around their necks yeah. she's wearing this nightgown that has these bands sort of around the neck in the similar like aesthetic yeah my, my notes at this point start referring to her as Cargaret. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew walks around hailing Egyptian gods in the appropriate order. He fills a spoon with blood from his wrist wound, and then he holds it over one of the torches around the sarcophagus before dumping it into a canopic jar. Margaret is watching from very close now, and suddenly rocks are crashing through the windows of Matthew's home. <laughs> Paul is letting himself in why I, I thought this was at the museum at first but yeah. it's just mm-hmm. a, a fake out t- to freak us out but he's at their house now why is he breaking into their home i don't know knock on the door bust down the door to go inside you're going to do that eventually anyway there's no it doesn't make sense to throw a rock through the window if you're trying to get in matthew slices open the bandages over kara's face with his daughter's sudden encouragement apparently he didn't even know she was here 
I, I assumed they drove together to get here, <laughs> but this whole time she's been sneaking up, he literally didn't even know she was in the room. Yeah, they took separate cars. Well, they came from different places, though. Did they? I thought she was staying at the house that he was staying at. She was in, she the, was in hospital. the hospital. But he brought her from the hospital just now, I thought. No, I think he went... He, he went probably to the ran jars. home. He grabbed the jars. He went to the yeah, museum. I, I thought he brought her for all of that because oh, I thought no. the point was that he was like, okay, you're right. We can we can resurrect her right oh, now. I didn't think any. I didn't think that. What 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 is his response to her saying, "Help me"? You know, I need help in the hospital. He's like, "Fuck this girl! I'm going to go raise a mummy from the dead," and then he leaves. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't, thought the whole point was I that mean, they're they're possessed at this point. Yeah. There's no logic to it. As he's cutting the bandages off of Kara's face, he's pushing really hard with this knife, and I was worried he was just going to slice the face in half. Uh, he's reading from the script for the ritual. Take away my eyes. Open thine. Instantly, the tissue draped across the mummy eye sockets sinks into its head. Next, he says, May Anubis open thine mouth. But... He really doesn't wait for the mummy to take action here. He just grabs the lower jaw and just smashes it in, pulling her mouth open. open. (laughs) Uh, Next, he goes for the heart, and he smashes the rib cage open. He seems disappointed to find nothing there, but when he sees the smile on his daughter's face, he realizes that the mummy intends to take his daughter's organs by taking over her body completely. And he just goes crazy and starts smashing this mummy to pieces. But there's a whirlwind in the museum, and the transfer is already taking place. When he looks up at his daughter, she's wearing this the full Egyptian makeup, and he starts chasing her with the same blade that he sliced up the bandages with. She screams, and a pillar falls over on her father, crushing him to the floor, which is the same way that the girl killed her father in the past. And, and the, he's dead. Yeah, and the, well, the prophecy said that he would die anyway. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, we see a wide shot outside the museum as Kara slash Margaret throws open the doors to the museum and steps out into the world. We see her shadow falling across the entire city, and we crossfade to a close-up of her eyes before we fade to black. This is where the movie should have started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 but I really wanted to go the other way afterwards. Like, she's wandering out of the museum. She's going, taxi, and they keep going by it, and she goes, God damn it. <laughs> yeah. She murders every taxi driver that anybody's ever talked to. What? <laughs> I'll murder a thousand taxi drivers. Then I'll find a taxi. Huh? No, probably not. The director here was Mike Newell. This was his directorial debut. He directed Four Weddings and a Funeral, Donnie Brasco, Pushing Tin, Mona Lisa Smile, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and Prince of Persia. He was also an EP on 200 Cigarettes, High Fidelity, and Traffic. Writer Alan Scott wrote the screenplay. He also wrote Don't Look Now and The Witches for our previous film's director, Rogue, Nicholas Rogue. He also wrote Daryl. Uh, yeah. An- another writer, Chris Bryant, uh, also wrote on Don't Look Now. Another writer, Clive Exton, uh, just after this he wrote Red Sonia. Hmm. The novelist was Bram Stoker. He's obviously a famous gothic horror novelist. He invented Dracula. And he gets a credit in every adaptation of the Count Dracula story, along with all the mummy things that I mentioned earlier. And it's pretty crazy that he wrote about mummy before they even really had uncovered, like Tutankhamun's tomb. Like, and he was he was very strict around like 1912, right? It was somewhere in the like 1920s. Was it in the 20s? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so he wrote this in 1903. Oh wow. And uh, But he was very interested in Egyptology, and he was actually a friend of the family who made the discovery of uh, King Tut's tomb. But, I mean, there had been a lot of tombs he, yeah, uncovered, yeah, yeah. but at that point, this was just the most famous right. undiscovered, untouched tomb yes. right. to date. And obviously, at the time the story was written, it hadn't been discovered, right. so this would have been like the first such discovery. Editor Terry Rollins, he was an editor on Watership Down and Alien before this. He also did Chariots of Fire, Blade Runner, Yentl, Legend, Alien 3, Trapped in Paradise, Goldeneye, The Saint, U.S. Marshals, and The Core. Yeah. You want me to hack the planet? <laughs> <laughs> Assistant editor, Monty Hellman, directed The Shooting and Ride in the Whirlwind, a pair of 1966 westerns, both starring Jack Nicholson. He also directed Two Lane Blacktop, and he wrote the story and directed Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. He was also an EP on Tarantino's first real movie, Reservoir Dogs. Charlton Heston was Matthew Corbeck. This is Heston's second film this year after Mountain Men. 
He only had six days between the wrap of that film and the start of this one. He has an acting Oscar for Ben-Hur. He was Moses in Ten Commandments. He's Detective Thorne in Soylent Green. He's George Taylor in Planet of the Apes. Susanna York was Jane Turner. She's Lara in Superman's 1, 2, and 4. She's Margaret in A Man for All Seasons. And she's Alice in They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Which is a movie about a horse launcher. <laughs> Stephanie Zimbalist played Margaret Corbeck. She was Laura Holt on Remington Steel. Patrick Drury played... Uh, well, sorry. Uh, I wanted to bring up uh, Stephanie Zimbalist because she's the daughter of Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., um, who's of vo- course the the who's that? well uh, he I I mostly know him uh, as voice acting stuff oh okay um but they actually got to act voice act together in an episode of Batman the animated series oh, in, did my, they? in one of my favorite episodes called the trial were they playing father and daughter uh no she was playing a district attorney who was captured and Batman is being put on trial in Arkham Asylum by all the inmates of Arkham oh, okay because they believe that he is the cause of all their problems okay like that he create Batman created them and the district attorney who wants to basically arrest Batman for vigilantism is forced to defend him oh, okay it's a really amazing episode <laughs> <laughs> um Patrick Drury played Paul Whittier. Uh, he plays John O'Leary on Father Ted and Lord Chamberlain in The Crown. Nadim Sawala played Dr. El Sadak. Nadim was Aziz Fakesh in The Spy Who Loved Me, Tangier Security Chief in Living Daylights, World Council of Ministers in The Avengers, back as Gamel in Sphinx next year, presumably also shot in Egypt. Ian McDiarmid played Dr. Richter. He's Palpatine. And we'll see him again next year as uh, a character in Dragon Slayer. Yeah, he's like a preacher or a priest or something. Yeah. Uh, Miriam Margoyles played Dr. Kadira. She's Mrs. Mingott in The Age of Innocence. She's the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo plus Juliet, the Baz Luhrmann one. Uh, she's also Professor Pomona Sprout in the Harry Potter movies. But not the Harry Potter movie that Mike Newell directed. <laughs> right. Um is she not in that one? She's no. in most of them. Is she in all of them? I think so. I thought she was only in the one. She's in the second one for sure. I think she's definitely in Deathly Hollows because that was the first one I saw when I was scrolling through. Yeah, she's in two. Uh, Deathly Hollows and the Chamber of Secrets, which, yeah. okay. which is number two. So she's in two and seven part and, two. Yeah. She's also the voice of the matchmaker in Mulan. Uh, written by the rabbi from the parents wedding in (laughs) it's my turn uh, fairly recently she's also credited with being the first person to say fuck on british television in 1963 as a contestant on a game show although asterisk to the mulan thing i've credited multiple people with having contributed to the mulan script over the course of this podcast and looking into it there are actually 32 people with writing credits on mulan one is based on a story by five are screenplay credits including the rabbi from it's my turn one is a story co-head for dean de blau and 11 are for story and 13 are additional materials including little dragons and my bodyguard screenwriter alan ormsby and one is listed as poem uncredited with the name anonymous what is the point of listing an anonymous person as anonymous and uncredited on an imdb page <laughs> Michael Mellinger played Hamid, he's Kish in Goldfinger, and Christopher Fairbank played the Porter, he's Nick in Batman, he's Murphy in Alien 3, he's Magdalberg in The Fifth Element, and he's also the Broker in Guardians of the Galaxy, the guy with all the spikes on his face that wants to buy the uh, the Power Stone. Um, those were all the credits I had for this one. Uh, I wanted to mention the cinematographer, Jack Cardiff. Oh, okay. Because um, he's just had a very long career uh, from being the DP on African Queen, Oh, okay. Uh, all the way up to uh, things, including and beyond, but uh, Conan, uh, the Destroyer, and Cat's Eye. Oh, nice. Uh, so he's had quite a quite a variety of films under his belt. Uh, so our uh, production designer, we we named a couple of people who contributed to Bond films. So I was just yeah. going to mention our production designer here, Michael Stringer. Uh, in addition to uh, this movie, he was production designer on the 67 Casino Royale. Oh, okay. 
Uh, he also but it was extravagant if poorly written. <laughs> he also was production designer on that Return from the River Kwai. <laughs> oh, okay. The Andrew McClaglin movie. Yeah, an art director on Fiddler on the Roof. Um, also, I was going to mention uh, our costumes here is uh, Phyllis Dalton. Okay, that so, sounds familiar. Yeah, so she's she's got a bunch of, of credits, uh, including things like Dr. Zhivago, Oliver, and uh, and and my favorite, The Princess Bride. Ooh. Nice. I feel like she's got to have an Oscar for Oliver, right? Uh, let me check. Because that won Best Picture that year, but it also had amazing costume work. Where do they have the... I, I have it's... it up if, if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, she has two Oscars, uh, one in 1990 for Henry V, and one in 1966 for Dr. Zhivago. Okay. Uh, and then Oliver a, was what, 60? A nomination for 69 for Oliver. Oh, nomination. Okay. Well, good for her. Um, this movie is fun, but it takes too long to get where it's going. Um, it gets kind of sloppy towards the end. And it feels like the first act of what this movie should have been. Yeah, that's exactly what I was... Like, I... <sighs> I, I watched this whole thing and I just wanted to watch the Brendan Fraser mummy. That's all I wanted because I wanted it to start where it ended. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted I wanted them to to get past all this stuff. Let's let's get the possession done and then things are gonna start to get really interesting and that's where it ended. Although technically uh, Anaxuna Moon isn't resurrected until like the last ten minutes of the no, but the other mummy. mummy is yeah yeah we have Vaslu Imhotep. running around screaming at people. <laughs> Imhotep. Yeah, Imhotep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. he um, yeah because like th- that's when interesting stuff happens is when you have this possessed thing, this evil uh, going about the country doing terrible stuff. Like that's that's interesting. Because if your movie's about a mummy, it should have a mummy the whole time. Yeah, and, and it didn't seem like. Like, I know that they said that, oh, she killed thousands of people. It's like, yeah, but so did a lot of the pharaohs. I, I don't I don't feel like there was, like, a worldwide threat. Yeah, but they, they, killed, they killed them for reasons other than, like, oh, this person talked to my father. Right. But I, to me, like, the implication was that, you know, she she did all these things uh, and they, you know, they, you know, they were mad at her and, like, they killed, did they kill her or? Yeah. Um, but, I also wonder if she actually killed these people or if they just got hit by cars and they were yeah. like, that was her, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of cars in ancient Egypt. You know, I say it had to have been her because that car doesn't exist yet. <laughs> uh, but, but to me, like it was like, had they made some kind of grander threat, like she had conquered like all of this land and yeah. no one quite knew how she was able to, to seize like, it's like, Oh, so she's super powerful. Other yeah, than she's just, like the Mozart of conquering. Yeah. Like, so far, her only power is that is, is just making people die by accident. Yeah, and <laughs> like we don't know if if a Sherman tank comes at her if it's gonna like, do any damage. Do at any all? damage? Yeah. Like I, I don't know. I don't know what what strength she has now like, that she's been released. They it, say she composed her first genocide at seven. Uh, it, it it reminded me a lot. That's why I was like joking about the taxi thing. Yeah, because it reminded me a lot of Hocus Pocus, where. Here they they're are. Terrified oh. of the cars. They're, they're, here they are. Is this re- reincarnated witches, and they have absolutely no idea how modern society yeah, yeah, works. Yeah. They they jump into the Black River. Yeah. <laughs> what else did asshole. we just see that in? There was something else where we were watching. You're like, movie? this is. Oh, yeah. maybe. American maybe. Pickle. I can't remember, but it was something where someone time traveled and they're trying to step into the street and they're scared. And you were like, this is exactly like from Hocus Pocus. Hocus Pocus. <laughs> I still enjoyed the movie. Yeah. No, I, it's fine. I, I think that there was still enough in it that I I was amused the whole time mm-hmm. and I was engaged the whole time. And Heston's always fun. Yeah. He's he's always, you know, chewing the scenery and yeah. everything. And uh I feel like the whole cast works pretty well. I think Margaret is believably like possessed mm-hmm. and uh and the story at least makes sense. I just feel like there could have been more actually happening. And it's not enough of a of like for the stakes to just be people are dying around this happening mm-hmm. because they're all people that we don't care about and we know that they're dying because the mummy is on the same team as the people that we're following. Right. So it's not like Heston is suddenly going to get killed before this mummy gets resurrected. Yeah. And, and again, there was no like in the Brendan Fraser mummy they say if he gains full power he'll destroy the world. Right. It's like there was no there was never any th- threat that she that they she would do that. 
but it seems like she does at the end like i think the implication of seeing her shadow looming across all of egypt is that she's literally like on a war path to destroy the planet at the end of the film because first they show her shadow going down the steps right and then they they do this crossfade to her shadow over the entire city it's actually like a rotoscope of her shadow mm-hmm. it's not even a real yeah footage. but um but i got the impression that either she literally grew thousands of feet tall <laughs> or would have been awesome yeah, or she's just uh the implication is that she's going to take over the world it's kind of like the end of the forbin project yeah, yeah we're yeah. just like oh shit <laughs> they went this way with it yeah which I like. I like that choice. I wish more movies would do that, where they're just like, yep, apocalypse. Yep, Have whoops. fun. <laughs> yeah, but that's where the interesting stuff happens, and we yeah. don't get it. Um, but yeah, I still think it's enjoyable. I think it's actually maybe a thumbs up for me. Oh, it's a thumbs up for me. Yeah. I, I, I also think that I would recommend this f- to people just to be like, yeah, come watch this. It's got a lot of uh, Indiana Jonesy things happening in it. I think you find that interesting. It's better than the Tom Cruise Mummy. Is that yeah. is that reason enough to I, watch it? I still haven't watched that one. It's a weird one. <laughs> but the Mummy shows up in it less does. than twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I think it's it's decent. I, I can't decide where to put this one. Yeah, I'm wavering I, a lot on it. But me too. Yeah, like. Oh, there was a lot of stuff that could have been better, but uh, it was amusing and entertaining, and I liked it. <laughs> well, I, I'm i putting it just below the Windows threshold. It's right after Windows, because I, I feel, even though I did enjoy it, I I don't know, it, it's, I can't see myself watching it again, um, but at the same time, like, I would I would certainly tell people it's all this crazy weird Charlton Heston mummy movie like you wouldn't it, before the mummy craze happened mm-hmm. yeah uh, of the nineties uh, and it's pretty okay um, but you know but if you don't watch it I'm not gonna be like yeah you're not yeah you, you watch yeah. the like you said I'd rather watch the Brendan Fraser mummy is what, and yeah. so and yeah. I did <laughs> but I'd rather watch this than the Scorpion King or yeah any of the follow-ups yeah so, so i have it at 71 just below windows okay yep. i have it in 69th place just below bronco billy and just above the gong show movie i have the awakening in 38th place it's just under carney and just above fame it's pretty high yeah yeah I think that's everything for this one if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us we are vintage video pod on twitter facebook instagram and letterboxd or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Borderline, which IMDb describes like so. On the U.S.-Mexican border... Border cop Jeb Maynard is hunting for a human smuggler responsible for Jeb's partner's murder. We leave you now with the trailer for Borderline. Buenas noches, senor. Good evening. What's the problem, officer? Are my taillights out? No. It's just a routine check. What are you fellows doing up this time of night? Well, we have to deliver these tomatoes all the way up to L.A. That's my boy. I brought him along to help me. That's all you're hauling back there, tomatoes? <laughs> what else? Well, I thought maybe you might have some of your cousins stuck in the back there. <laughs> my worthless cousins. I would haul on the manure, <laughs> not tomatoes. You misjudge me, senor. Well, maybe. I'd still like to have a look just to make sure. Will you hand me the keys with your left hand, please? As you say, officer. Andale, pues. You step out of the truck, please, and step to the rear. You want to open that door for me? Well, what do you know? <laughs> All right, partner, let's get this other side open.
Close it up.